Welcome back, my name is Mark, this is Supersonic Sax. If it's your first time here, this channel is all about learning how to play the saxophone correctly from a mechanical perspective, so that you're never fighting with the instrument to make music. Today we're continuing our study of Sigurd Rascher's top tones for the saxophone and discussing the concept of tone imagination, which is actually a very challenging concept to address because since it is an entirely internal process, it is impossible to demonstrate. Rasher writes in the foreword to this section, All musical activity is the outcome of a balance between vivid, colorful, and exact tone imagination and skillful tone production. Without a precise concept of the music to be reproduced, we are unable to render it in a convincing manner. Incomplete command of tone production and control makes it impossible to project the experience of our inner ear fully. Therefore, the student must develop his inner ear as much as he practices his instrument. When I first read this about 15 years ago, I didn't give it much thought and then moved right on to the written exercise without realizing just how important this was. In the performance of any music, it's necessary to have a clear idea or goal in mind of what it's ultimately going to sound like. This is especially true of tone production on a wind instrument. As we all find out through experience, it's not sufficient to just press the keys and blow. The player must have a clear idea in their mind or rather ear of the desired sound to be produced. This is a point that is very easy to overlook in the so-called basic range of the saxophone. Finger a low F, and chances are when you blow, you're probably going to get something close to that low F. To play a high F, three octaves above that, you need to have much stronger aural imagery or tone imagination to give yourself the command, produce this tone. Part of the challenge in teaching this topic is that it's impossible to demonstrate what's happening in my mind as I play. So unlike every other aspect of musicianship, where a teacher can listen to you and offer constructive criticism on how you can improve, the only person who can measure your success in this area is you. There are certain intervals between pitches that the human ear recognizes as consonant. Two of those in particular which are used a lot in top tones are perfect fourths and perfect fifths. In the method book that I wrote, which is partly inspired by Rasher's work, I also include the other nine intervals in the tone imagination practice. So once you become more comfortable hearing fourths and fifths, try to gradually introduce the other intervals into your practice as well. So let's start with a perfect fifth of D in the staff to A above the staff. Play the D, then hold it out. Then before switching to the A, imagine that tone with your inner ear as vividly as possible to the point of realistically hearing a perfect fifth. Then play the A on your saxophone only after you've been successful in imagining it. Rasher recommends gradually ascending in scale fashion from the starting tone to the target note. So you're going to be actually playing the perfect fifth but you're practicing hearing the scale from D to A. Then you continue from A down a perfect fourth to E. In a similar fashion, you actually play the fourth, but you practice hearing the scale. This continues up and down the full range of the instrument in fourths and fifths and only constitutes about three quarters of a page. Nonetheless, this requires an intense amount of concentration to perform successfully. And Rasher addresses this by saying, since the growth of my mind's strength is an organic process, it goes without saying that it needs daily attention. Not a long time for the exercises on page 9 and 10, but 5 or 10 minutes every day, i.e. probably one line a day, or even half a line. On the next page, the tone imagination studies get even more challenging. In every measure, there is an octave, a perfect fourth, and another octave, which are organized in groupings of two measures. But there is more here than what is written on the staff. Rasher states that in the first measure, there was a hidden fifth between the first and third tones, and in the second measure, between the second and fourth tones. For the longest time, this aspect of the exercise went completely over my head. I think I understand what Rasher was saying now, but if there's anybody watching who studied with him, or any of his students, please feel free to further clarify in the comment section below. In the first measure, what is written is middle F to top F, but we're going to step through that octave by hearing the hidden perfect fifth with our inner ear before descending down a perfect fourth from F to the C and then down another octave to the C in the staff. So what you'll actually be playing is this.
but you want to practice hearing that C between the Fs. Analogously, in the second measure, we're going to put that hidden fifth between the E's. So again, you're playing what's written. But you're practicing hearing that extra B. I want to point out that I played those way faster than we should be practicing them just to demonstrate the presence of the extra note. When you're practicing these, you'll want to hold each note as long as necessary to give yourself enough time to vividly create the imagined tone before moving to it. But wait, there's more. The goal of this exercise is to aim for perfect intonation, balanced dynamics, smooth legato, uniform tone quality, and continuous vibrato. Rasher makes the following observation. In the beginning, it is too difficult to think of these aims simultaneously. Concentrate, therefore, on one at a time for at least a few months. So page 10 alone has several years worth of practice material on it, which is quite overwhelming if you stop and think of the amount of work involved. But as the author always stressed, the important thing is that these exercises are done every day, even if just for a few minutes. This particular tone imagination study of octaves, fourths, and fifths is one of those where you look at it and think, that's easy, I got this. Then you try it and you're like, I don't got this. Actually, I really don't got this. What I mean is, it's a great source of challenging material that develops several things simultaneously that all have a very positive impact on your saxophone playing. In the upcoming part three of this series, we're going to get into the overtone series, which, to paraphrase Rasher, is where the effort put into these preliminary exercises starts to bear fruit. Until then, keep doing those breathing exercises and stay tuned for the next video.